Uh, we've entitled the message this morning, Snakes. Snakes. So, what better way to talk about snakes than a few dad jokes? How does a snake shoot something with a boa and arrow? What kind of snake keeps its car the cleanest? Well, of course, a windshield viper. What's a snake's favorite school subject? Obviously, it's math because it's an adder. The story is told of a cowboy who lost his favorite Bible while he was mending fences out on the range. Three weeks later, a snake walked up to him carrying the Bible in its mouth. The cowboy could not believe his eyes. He took the precious book out of the snake's mouth, raised his eyes heavenward, and exclaimed, It's a miracle! Not really, said the snake. Your name is written inside the cover. <laughs> the fear of snakes, it's actually pronounced aphidiophobia. Aphidiophobia. Anybody been officially diagnosed with aphidiophobia? Well, if you have been, whether you want to raise your hand or not, approximately 2 to 3% of the population that, that subjects itself to those things has an official diagnosis, official prognosis of possessing aphidiophobia. Uh, uh, there we go. A fear of snakes. But experts estimate that up to 50% of the population is at least uncomfortable around snakes. Anybody really fans of snakes? You know, you get a little unsettled. There's a few of you. I remember when I was a child, my dad was stationed in Key West, Florida. He's in the military. In Miami, it was like a great highlight for us. We were able to go to visit a special zoo, the Miami Serpentarium, that was just nothing but snakes. And you could tell even my mom was just a little bit hesitant. They gave you the opportunity to drape this big boa constrictor around you, and she's like, I, I'm having no part of that. Uh, and I was pretty excited uh, to see some of those things, and yet there's still something a little bit unsettling. Here in Minnesota, we have as many as 17 species of snakes, but only two are venomous, and they happen to be found right here in this corner of the state in southeastern Minnesota, two different varieties of rattlesnakes. They're both considered endangered. Uh, you, ha you aren't likely to see them. I don't know if any of you have ever came across one and, and happened to see one, but it is something that you have to be mindful of. I've taken my kids hiking out at Whitewater State Park, and they have signs saying, look out, be aware, but they're also unlikely to bother you if you don't bother them. That's what also what I'm told. I guess we hopefully won't find out by experience. But nobody really likes the threat uh, that a, a venomous snake can present. You know the difference, too, between a venomous snake and a poisonous snake, don't you? Uh, and this is no dad joke. But a, a venomous snake, it actually has to do with how the, the venom gets into your system. So if something is venomous, it's going to be injected, like by a bite or by a fang. And if it's poisonous, they're either secreting that, so if you like touch the body and it comes in contact with your skin, that's, that's considered poisonous. Or if you eat the snake, like many of us, of course, would be prone to do, right? <laughs> um, and, and you ingest it that way, that's considered something to be poisonous. So that's the difference. So if you're talking about poisonous snakes, not very many people actually understand what they're talking about there. There's a difference in the terminology, but we do have, as I mentioned, two venomous snakes uh, that are native to this part of the country. Now, all of that to say, snakes makes us uncomfortable. Snakes, typically, we're not, we're not big fans. We don't want to bring them into our house. We don't, a few of you might have pets, I suppose, but again, typically, the majority of us are, are not really crazy about those kind of things. There's a fear, there's a discomfort. And that some, to some degree, experts have theorized about that. They, the, the secular scientists will say, well, that, that's a part of our evolution, that's part of our development, uh, that we've been uh, incorporated into our genetic structure, that we aren't comfortable with snakes. You see it certainly in mythology and legend. Uh, the, the Greek goddess Medusa uh, is pictured as being uh, a, a person who has a head full of hair, but the hair, instead of being hair, is a head of snakes. 
uh, and that's supposed to be this horrific imagery uh, that also turns the people who look directly at her into stone. Well, another thing that kind of gets our aversion that people have theorized is actually what we read here in Genesis chapter 3, and we see Eve's encounter with the serpent, with the snake. And we're going to talk a little bit about snakes, but we're really going to focus more this morning on who possessed the snake and how he presented himself to Adam and Eve as Satan, as the deceiver, as the accuser, as the tempter that pointed them because of their own desires, because of their own wants and pointed them into a way that would go against God's command. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, just reading the first verse this morning. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Hear the word of God. Moses writes, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? This is the Word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, that on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add His blessing here to the reading of His Word this morning. The first thing I want you to be aware of as we walk through the outline this morning is that God created Satan. God created Satan. Now, you don't see that explicitly here In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, we're introduced to the serpent. We're introduced to a talking creature, which kind of throws us off there immediately already. Like, was was Adam regularly having conversations with the other creatures in the garden? Here's the answer. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. The Bible does seem to present that Eve having a conversation with, with the snake in the tree or wherever it doesn't really even exactly tell us how that took place but we we might picture that in in our minds in, in our imaginations she doesn't seem to be thrown off by that so it's possible i suppose we're we're engaging a little bit of speculation here or maybe it's that she's still relatively newly created and she doesn't know uh it doesn't have a lot of experience it's It's not something she's encountered before, but hey, uh, it's a new experience, and let's, let's just see where it takes us. We aren't exactly sure what's going on there, but what we do know is that she has this conversation, and what we also know later on from other passages of Scripture, that this is clearly identified with not just being a creature who's acting of its own volition, but being Satan. We see this, for example, in Revelation, where uh, John records that the dragon, this old serpent from before, is in reference to Satan, and he makes that clear. We have many times where we see, uh, even in the curse, it's going to be delivered towards the end of the chapter, and Satan's head is going to be bruised by the seed of the woman. There's this connection that is made from this Old Testament prophecy and in the New Testament fulfillment that makes it clear that what we see, the being that is interacting with Eve, is indeed Satan. Now, where does Satan come in? How do we determine that God created Satan? There's two passages that give us some insight into that. The first one is going to be in Isaiah chapter 14. So let's look a little bit at Satan's heavenly origins. If you're following along the bullet point underneath, God created Satan. We're going to look at his heavenly origins. If you look in Isaiah chapter 14 and you start in verse 1, what we see there is Isaiah is getting information from God talking about somebody who is going to be in the future. Uh, there, there, there's, there's events that are unfolding and taking place. 
God's future plans for Israel. For the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and will again choose Israel and will set them in their own land. And the sojourners, the travelers, will join them and will attach themselves to the house of Jacob. And as you scan through the text, you'll see that God is talking about future events, future reassurances, but he's also talking about the people who have put them into this position. Picking up in verse 4, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon, how the oppressor has ceased, the insolent fury ceased, the Lord has broken up the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers that struck people and peoples in wrath with unceasing blows, that ruled the nations with, in anger with unrelenting persecution. And so, as he's giving that down through verse 11, you, you see the, the, the rebuke, the, 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 the direction that's being given from God through the prophet Isaiah, decrying these people who have oppressed his people. But what we see picking up in verse 12 is the force, the influence behind the oppressors is not necessarily just of human origin. Picking up in verse 12, how are you fallen from heaven? O day star, son of the dawn. Some of you reading the King James, it says Lucifer, son of the morning. The idea here is that this being is created by God and had an original function. Let's keep reading. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And so what this tells us is that Satan in his original state, before maybe he was even identified as Satan, had a different kind of function. We get more details upon that in Ezekiel chapter 28. In Ezekiel chapter 28, again you read the context of the passage, there is forces that have opposed themselves to God forces, human forces that have opposed themselves to God's people. But there's again somebody behind that. So you pick up in verse 11 of Ezekiel 28. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, and so if you look earlier in the passage, this prince of Tyre has been the oppressor of God's people. But Ezekiel recording this admonition against the king of Tyre, we believe this is identifying the force behind him as Satan. And so we get more details about Satan and his influence on the prince of Tyre. You were the signet of perfection, picking up the end of verse 12, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You, so Satan, were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle, and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On that day, and this is crucial to our point here, that you were created, they were prepared. And it tells us this created being was an anointed guardian cherub. You were there functioning as one of God's heralds. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. And so this corresponds with what we just read in Isaiah. He had a function, but what was his downfall? It was his Pride, And that's actually the next point on your outline. It was pride that led to his downfall. Pride precedes a plunge. And so, this being that God created to serve him, to give testimony to his glory, not unlike the scenario that we read about later in Isaiah, where we have people, or these beings floating in front of God, where, we, where he looks up 
and, and sees the throne room of heaven, and there are angels floating around him saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That kind of gives us an idea of the function that Satan would have had before his fall. This Lucifer, this day star, this son of the morning, he was a bright being. He was somebody who was part of capturing God's glory and drawing attention to God's glory. And yet, he had it in his heart, I don't want to be the one who is directing and reflecting God's glory. I want that attention I want that spectacle for myself. And so, what we're told later on in Revelation chapter 12, talking about an event that, is had in the, that has occurred in the past, Revelation, John records, and another sign appeared in heaven, verse 3, Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems or crowns. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven, and cast them to the earth. And what we see in that cryptic prophetic reference there, in this apocalyptic language, we believe that this is a reference to Satan being cast out of heaven and taking a third of the angelic beings with him, which is what we would also say is the explanation of the origination of demons. This helps us understand that Satan and his host is in control of many things that we see happening on the earth. Because Satan, starting here in Genesis chapter 3, in the passage that we read, reveals himself time and again to be hostile to humanity. Hostile to humanity. And that's the next point that you should record on your outline. How does he show this opposition? How does he show this hostility to, 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 to humanity? He works in people's lives, especially those who don't know Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, as he's talking to them and reminding them of where they used to be, he said, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the, pow the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, reminding them of what they used to be like before they came to know Christ. The default position of humanity. Satan isn't to blame. He is operating against our own desires. He's pushing us and motivating us to follow those things that are in opposition to God. But he's a skillful manipulator. And he pushes you and prods you along to follow in the ways that are going to go against God. How do we know that Satan isn't to blame? Well, James tells us, where does temptation come from? Where does sin come from? It's when every man is drawn away by his own lust, by his own desires, and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. And James says, do not Air. Do not be deceived in that way. Be aware of the deception and be aware of the influence of the deceiver. And that's important because most of the world isn't going to be thinking about that or isn't going to see a problem with that. But understand that the same Satan who is preying upon all of humanity also praise on believers. So Peter gives this warning in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And he's talking to Christians. So we are susceptible to Satan's praying. We are susceptible to his hostility. We can be tempted. And so Peter says, be on your guard. Be aware of this and be watchful. Depend on God's strength. Depend on His Spirit. Ground yourself in the Word of God because the threat is real. The temptation and its power in your life are real. 
And God wants you to be aware that there are forces in this world, there are beings in this world who would like nothing better than to see you follow your heart and oppose yourself to God in the direction that He wants for you. Also, remember this. The New Testament makes it clear that Satan isn't always going to be this kind of monstro- monstrosity, this, this malevolent appearing being with, a, with horns and a pitchfork and, and uh, kind of just leering and, and how we often see him portrayed in popular media and, and different things like this. How is he going to present himself? He's going to present himself in a bright, appealing way positive way. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. Satan even disguises himself as an angel of light. And so it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. This is how Satan portrays himself, and this is how those who work in league with Satan will often present themselves as well. We need to be aware because they could be positive. They could seem like they're going to be good influences on us. Nobody's going to come to you and say, hey, you know, do you want to get in league with Satan with me today? Typically, that's not going to be the case. They might even tell you, hey, this is what you need to do to be a good Republican. Or, hey, this is what you need to do uh, in order to be a good citizen. Or this is what you do because everybody else is doing it. You need to be tolerant. You need to be accommodating. You need to be loving. And therefore, discard things that God clearly wants for us in this world. Don't walk away thinking that, I'm, that the pastor said uh, the Republican Party is satanic, by the way. That, that's not the application you should be drawing from today. But what we are saying is that sometimes temptation can present itself in ways that we aren't going to put our guard up. You know, we would never give in to a Democrat, but we might give in to a Republican. Some of us might think that way. And yet, what we have to understand is political party principles don't always line up exactly with God's conduct for us. We have to be on our guard because temptations can present themselves to us in ways that are designed to make us let our guard down and designed in ways that are going to appeal to what seems right. But as the Proverbs tell us, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end leads to death. People who seem to be on our side, who seem to want their best for us, aren't always leading us in a way that is consistent with the way that God would have us act. So we judge, and we judge properly. We judge against God's criteria of people who love truth, people who love righteousness, people who maintain fidelity. These are things that we need to be careful about, even as we make these decisions, as we weigh them out. Satan will not always appear monstrous, and he sometimes tempts believers using the things that they already want. For example, Paul talks about this when he's talking to couples and the nature of their physical sexual relationship in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5. And he's saying, do not deprive yourselves of one another in this physical activity, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Uh, And so he says, typically speaking, you need to be around each other, you need to be affectionate towards each other, but then come together again. And why? Because he says, here's what you need to be aware of. What does it mean that Satan is walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour? This is one of the ways he can do it. So that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Again, Satan using something that he knows you're already wired for, this desire that you already have, and he can take it. And instead of giving attention to your husband, giving attention to your wife, well, it's been a while, you know, they've been out on the road, or they've been so busy with other things, and whether it's looking at something on a screen, or somebody, a neighbor is giving me attention, a co-worker is giving me attention, that he hasn't given me that attention in quite a while. 
And this is how Satan gets his claws in. How Satan plants his fangs in. Satan motivates you to give in to something that perhaps a part of you already wants. Be mindful. Be aware of his technique. Satan tempts us. Satan can also harass us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7, the famous thorn in the flesh passage, this is what he says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh. And where did that come from? It was a messenger, Paul says, of Satan to harass me. Some of you uh, have seen that in your King James translation, to buffet me, to, to give me a hard time, but to keep me from coming conceited. God allowed Satan to do that, but that's one of the things Satan delights to do, is to cause difficulty in the lives of believers. It's important to know, even as Nathan was telling us during the Sunday school hour, challenging us and reminding us of the responsibility that we have as believers to make disciples of others around us, understanding that Satan delights in nothing better than to disrupt the delivery of the gospel. Jesus telling the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, verse 19, he says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one, another terminology used to describe Satan, comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. So be mindful of that, parents, moms, as you're sitting down maybe with your kids, going over with them truths from Scripture, and you can't figure out why Junior keeps looking out the window or why he's distracted by his television and video games and different things like this, other things that seem to go on. I don't think we're out of line to say Satan doesn't make it easy on us. Satan gives us these kinds of distractions that we're trying to do the work of impressing upon their minds and hearts God's truth. Satan isn't going to make that without obstacles, without hindrances. Be aware. Be aware that it's not just junior you're working against. There are forces of evil willing and able and eager even to bring in distractions along the way. Knowing that Satan is real, knowing that Satan exists, also though reminds us that his destiny has been declared. We do struggle against him, but he's not something that we'll have to endure forever. John records in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7, now war arose in heaven, Michael the archangel and his angels fighting against the dragon, another term for Satan. The dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down. Here's the reference again to what we read about earlier. That ancient serpent, that snake in the Eden, who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And what is his ultimate destiny? Not just being cast out of heaven, but listen to what John records in Revelation chapter 20. Verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be released for a little while. So the thousand years of peace and prosperity under the rule and reign of King Jesus is going to be peaceful in part. Why? Because Satan's out of the picture. Because God is reigning. And there's going to be peace on the world. But at the end of that thousand years, what's going to happen? Revelation 20, verse 7. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. So there is going to come a time where Satan is released for a little while. But ultimately, he will be 
recorded, it says in Revelation 20, verse 10, and banished into the lake of fire, into the bottomless pit. It says in verse 10, the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. This is a place that Jesus says is prepared for the devil and his angels. It is a reality that human beings, though, will also face. Matthew 25, 41, God says, condemning those who have not received the gospel, he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil, prepared for Satan and his angels, those demonic beings that have been banned to that. This is one of the reasons why, even as we understand Satan's influence, Satan's accusations, Satan's temptations, why we must be all the more diligent to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Because people will end up in the same place that he is unless they have trusted Christ as Savior. This is why we give the gospel. This is why we are motivated with the urgency of the situation because God is not willing that any should perish, that all should reach repentance, to turn from their sins, to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. So friends, we even here must recognize in response to the reality of Satan and who he is and how he has also always been hostile to humanity, recognize that he is real, respect the fact that he exists, Without reading the verse right now, you can look at Jude verses 9 and 10, only one chapter in that short book, and it records the reality of even one of God's archangels, Michael, would not take Satan on directly. He realizes Satan's power, Satan's influence, Satan's capabilities, and he respects that. There are many out there in organized religion today who advocate that it's appropriate for Christians to go on and start binding Satan and, and start rebuking him and different things. The Bible doesn't present that kind of an attitude. We need to be mindful that we, in our own strength, are not capable of overcoming the power of Satan. What is the answer that we have? What is the the, the way that we can encounter and hope to overcome the attacks of Satan. We must rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. We must submit ourselves to God and resist the devil. James chapter 4 and verse 7. James tells his audience to submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, resist Satan, and he will flee from you. So when he is opposing you, you don't go around rebuking him. You go around understanding that it is God and the gospel that will help you to say no, that will give you the strength and the power to resist his onslaughts. Continuing to read, though, that if you give in to temptation, if he has the victory, it's not hopeless either. You have the capability to restore your relationship with God and renew the path that God has given to you. Resist him, but in those times where you haven't resisted like you should, we should also turn and repent. Keep reading in James chapter 4 and verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will exalt you. Acknowledge your sin. Acknowledge your failure and renew that relationship with God. God is willing and does forgive. John records in his epistle that when we confess our sins, what will God do? He's not going to say, well, I'll make you do penance. Uh, I'll, I'll hold it against you. You've got to kind of earn your way back, get away from Satan, get back to me. No. Confess your sins, and God will be faithful. He will be just. He is reliable. He will forgive your sins. He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. We sing a song around here sometimes that says this, When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, Upward I look and see Jesus there. 
the one who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on Christ and forgive you and forgive me. Satan wants us to despair. Satan wants us to look and say, there's nothing you can do. Look how rotten you are. Look, why would God ever take you back? You keep saying, yeah, I'm a Christian, and you keep looking at that screen. You keep looking at those pictures you know you shouldn't be. What kind of a Christian? Why would God ever take you? Friends, that's not your conscience. Friends, that's not anything originating in the Spirit. That's Satan tempting you. That's Satan telling you you're not good enough. What does God say? You are my child. I have forgiven you. You look to Jesus because that's what I'm looking at. Your sins are covered under the blood of of Jesus Christ. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. That's God's truth. That's what Satan doesn't want you to believe. That's what Satan doesn't want you to cling to. Satan is a deceiver. Satan is a liar. Satan is not a good influence. Let's just say that. And we're going to see that unfold here as we continue our study in Genesis. But Satan is real. His influence is real. But so is the victory that we can have through Jesus Christ. And Jesus destroys the devil's work. That's the point we want you to remember. Yes, Satan is real. But yes, you can have victory over the devil because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. He has crushed the head of the snake. And He has made it possible for you to be set free. You don't have to spend eternity with Satan. You can spend eternity in God's presence because of what Jesus Christ has done. Friend, if you don't know Jesus and you don't have that certainty, Satan keeps tempting you to look back on you and see all the things you've done, all the reasons why you don't deserve it. God tells you, I know about all of those. And that's why I sent Jesus to die. That's why He took the consequences that you deserve so that whoever believes in Him will not perish, will not die. Instead, He will have everlasting life. And friend, that can be yours when you look to Him as Savior.